right, so before we jump right in today, I want to once again encourage you to sign up to serve somewhere. We have seven or eight, I think, weeks left until we begin a second Sunday morning service, and so all the serve teams are like, oh, hands on deck, we need all the people we can get, we all, they all need double the people for Sunday morning, and so they are all looking for people, you can talk to any one of them, and they would jump at the chance to talk to you about it. Um, some of the teams, by the way, do have more requirements than others. For some of them, you need to be a partner, or you need clearances, like to work with our kids, or that sort of thing. But go ahead and get that process started now. Sign up to serve somewhere. Like I said, we are the church. It's not something we attend. It's who we are, right? We serve each other. We love each other. So on March 17th, I don't know if I said this publicly yet, but March 17th is the day that we're moving to two services, 9.15 and 11.15. Let me know if you need help getting connected there. Secondly, I do want to give two disclaimers about this message. The first is that you, there's a chance you may not want your kids in here today. Um, I don't ever say that about sermons, but there are going to be some adult conversations in this particular message here to the third church in Revelation, and I just want you to be warned up front. Your kids do what you'd like with that information, um, but Effie Kids is always ready for them anytime you'd like somewhere for them to go. And the second disclaimer is, and I want to say this very clearly and for you to hear me, I did not fashion this message to anyone in particular. I say that because there are more than a few people who could feel a little bit targeted by this today. And if you have an issue, take it up with Jesus because I planned this series three months ago. (laughs) Maybe more. I think it was October when I first... I did not realize this message would fall on this week, okay? So I'm just following it through. This is the third church of Revelation. I don't want any email later. So you can turn to the book of Revelation. Bring your Bible to church, y'all, especially if you are struggling with, like, how to read it, what to, where to go, how to find certain books. This is great practice time to find those chapters, and right? A lot of us look it up on our phones, but bring your actual physical Bible. Circle stuff, underline stuff, highlight stuff, take notes, right? Just a good reminder. Turn to the book of Revelation with me, not just look it up. It, it's helpful to have an actual paper Bible. We're continuing our series called Dear Church. This is based on messages that Jesus sent to the seven churches of Asia Minor. First week, we looked at the Church of Ephesus, the drifted, forgetful church, right? Do you remember that one? Last week, we looked at the church at Smyrna, the persecuted, worn-down church. Today, we're going to look at the, the message Jesus sent to the third church, the church at Pergamum. Everybody say Pergamum. Pergamum. It's just a fun word to say. Now, let me just give you a little bit of background on this church. This particular city of Pergamum served as a regional capital for the Greek Empire, and when Rome became the superpower, it was also a capital city for that region under Rome as well. So by the time John wrote the book of Revelation, it had already been a capital city for 300 years. It was set high on the landscape, and on a good day you could see it from the sea from 10 to 15 miles away. It had a population of 150,000 people, which was huge at the time, It boasted of grand architecture and design. Uh, There was a large theater built into the hill. It was noted for it it being a hub of politics and culture and and education. And in fact, it had one of the largest libraries in the world. It was second only to Alexandria, Egypt, actually, with like 200,000 volumes of books or something crazy like that. But it, it was a city also addicted to idolatry and worship of counterfeit gods. There were three temples dedicated to the worship of the Roman emperor in the city, and there were also temples to Greek and Roman gods, Athena and Zeus, you'll recognize some of those names, and and you could find numerous idols and statues and temples dedicated to these false gods. So anytime there would be sacrifices being made in this city and, and incense offered up to the idols. Now, you have to understand that behind all of these idols and gods, lowercase g, gods, are demonic spirits, right? We understand that, right? 
It's a spiritual war, not a physical one. They're not just statues and things made of stone. They're, they're demonic forces behind all of these things. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 that sacrifices offered to idols are sacrifices to demons. So if you're worshiping idols, again, not statues or just burning incense, it's worshiping demons. And so Pergamum was full of all sorts of this stuff going on. Um, they had gone so far in these false religions, it was just this hotbed for demonic activity. It was a city of Satan. Jesus actually calls it that in this passage. Anything that tries to draw glory away from God or is jealous of the praise that we give to God is demonic. Right? Satan and his agenda is wrapped and disguised in all forms and shapes and packages and people, we get caught up in it. It's like a web, right? And so this city was caught up in it. They were deeply committed to evil ideologies and agendas. And we see this today too. It's not that far removed from our own culture. It's not hard to see what it would be like living in a culture like this, right? They were <clears throat> worshiping at the altar of secularism and immorality and self-centered ideologies that were just so harmful. Then they said, to fit in, you better worship Caesar and Zeus and all these other false gods. Today, it's you better do what media and culture tells you. You better do what the mob tells you, right? You're supposed to conform to what we tell you. It's the same demon, same devil back then as it is today, just in a different form, dressed a little differently. So as his church, we are called to be set apart from all of that. Pure, clean, spotless bride of Jesus Christ. He's called us to a standard of holiness, not to compromise and have one foot in and one foot out. Because really, what's the point of being here if you're going to have one foot out? You could be sleeping in right now on a Sunday morning. If you're going to be out, be out, right? If you're going to be in, be all in. There's no point in being half-hearted when it comes to approaching faith in Jesus Christ. Be all in. The church at Pergamum could be called the compromising church, or I've also been calling it the selfish church, but I don't think that goes quite far enough. It's the compromising church. And some people within this church had conformed to the immoral, godless customs and behaviors of the city of Pergamum that they lived in. They compromised to the culture, and ultimately it would ruin them from the inside out if they didn't repent. Jesus, in this letter in Revelation 2, is calling them to repentance. So I, I want to read this letter in its entirety today, and then we're going to pick it apart piece by piece so we can understand it. It's, it's, <clears throat> I don't think the past two letters have quite captured the confusing nature of Revelation <laughs> yet. Like, we're not quite there yet, but this one, we start to get there. So I want to read it all to you and then explain what it actually means. So Revelation 2, verse 12. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me, even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. <coughs> Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit. And understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone. And on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. Don't you just love Revelation? What? <laughs> Full of white stones and hidden manna and weird references, right? But let's start at the beginning here and unravel some of this. So in all seven letters, Jesus begins... By giving us a description of who he is. And you'll notice that it's not the same. Each week has been a different depiction of who Jesus is, right? To Ephesus, he was the one who holds the stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the gold lampstands. 
to Smyrna, he described himself as the first and the last, the one who died and who was raised to life. In this one, he describes himself as a two-edged sword, the one with the two-edged, sharp two-edged sword. What could that possibly mean? So I went digging, right? I found Hebrews 4.12 that says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. It is the very word of God. Jesus has the word of God on his lips at all times. And with only the words of his mouth, Jesus has all power and all authority. That's what he's saying here to this church at Pergamum. God's word is more than just a collection of words, by the way. It's more than just pages in a book. It is life-giving and life-changing. It sets the standard for right and wrong. I think Jesus here is trying to draw this church's attention to his word. Even through the, the very description of himself, he's drawing the attention to the living, breathing word of God, the living and active word of God. If this church could just get a hold of the word of God, right, read and know and understand his word, truly live by it, they'd be in a whole lot less trouble. <laughs> Jesus Christ himself is the word. When Jesus describes himself in these, in these letters, he didn't choose a description for himself at random. There is purpose and layers of meaning behind it. The governor of Pergamum had actually been granted this rare power known as the right of the sword, believe it or not. <laughs> right? Meaning that he could perform executions. It, it was something that was unique to Pergamum. No other city had this particular right for the governor. So Jesus describing himself to this particular church as a sharp, double-edged sword wasn't only about the word, but it was about them and what he could do, right? It was deeper than that. Pergamum may have a sword, but Jesus has a greater sword. And I think he's also saying here he's not afraid to use it. This is a warning to the church. You don't get... You don't use a symbolic name for yourself like a sword, a weapon, unless there's some urgency here. Get your act together, church. Because God is slow to anger, but he does get angry. Right? He doesn't allow evil to continue forever. Rome may think they have authority. Pergamum governor may think he has authority, but only Jesus Christ has ultimate authority. He has ultimate power over life and death. And he's going to use his sword at points, to separate the contenders from the pretenders. <laughs> By the way, later in Revelation, John tells us that it's with his sword that Jesus will one day wipe out evil once and for all. It's with his word, a sharp, two-edged sword that cuts, right? The word of God is alive and active, and it can pinpoint exactly where the issue is. It cuts between joint and marrow, soul and spirit. It knows exactly where you're struggling right now, where you're rebellious and disobedient right now. It can cut right to that. I've experienced this before in my own life, where I'm in worship, and I'm worshiping with my whole heart, and suddenly tears are just streaming, and I'm like, God, what are you even doing right now, right? I go, I, I feel like I'm being healed of something from the inside out, but I couldn't tell you from what. But his word knows. His word cuts to that exact point that I need it. Jesus sees us. He truly sees us and understands us on a level that is divine. There's no other way to describe it. To some of us, that should scare us a little bit, though. We are exposed before Jesus. He can see us. And I think, I think a little bit of fear here is kind of the point because of what comes next. All right, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, you know how most of these letters have three parts to them. Commendation, correction, and counsel. He's going to commend them, tell them what they're doing well, encourage them. But he's also going to bring some sort of correction and then counsel them how to get back on track. Now, the letter to Pergamum follows that pattern and begins with this commendation, appreciation, encouragement. Revelations 2.13. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you've remained loyal to me. 
You refused to deny me, even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan City. So encouraging that Jesus knows what we're going through and the fight that we're up against, isn't it? Right? He noticed this church. He saw that they were living among the throne of Satan. He saw how they were persecuted and threatened, and yet they held fast to their faith in Jesus. That is something. It's not everything, as we see here in a minute, but it's something to just hold fast. We've talked about faithfulness a lot lately. To just not deny him, to hang in there even when things are tough, that is something. And it tells us that no matter where we live or what conditions we find ourselves in, the temptations that we face, we can be faithful to God. God will not put us in conditions that we cannot bear. Now, most people think, well, I've been in conditions that I cannot bear. The scripture is actually temptation that you cannot withstand. There's a difference, right? God will not tempt you more than you can bear, meaning if you've been tempted, you could have chosen the right response. We can be faithful to God. I hear a lot of excuses. People are like, well, you don't know my workplace. It's there are some crazy people in there, right? There's so much temptation. Whether you're in a Christian culture, a pagan culture, a godless and sinful culture, a sinful workplace, a tempting lifestyle, even a culture like per- Pergamum, Satan City, Jesus called it, it's possible to live for God. It's possible. You don't have to have perfect conditions to be faithful. But that also means you don't have excuses here either. Jesus isn't giving them an out. He mentions a man named Antipas. Now, I looked really hard into this. This is the only mention of Antipas in the Bible or in any church history. To the world, he was just an obscure, anonymous person. But Jesus went out of his way to make mention of him. I think that was for a very specific purpose, and this is just a theory. I have no confirmation of this, but my theory is that Jesus mentions a specific person here that this church knew personally, specifically so that this church couldn't weasel out of the word of God. They couldn't weasel out. There's something, and Jesus calls out sexual sin here in the next part. There's something about sexual sin, sexual immorality that makes you a little weaselly. We describe people as, like, slimy, right, when, they, when you can feel it on them, or weaselly, or, or, you know, slippery. It tends to go hand in hand with sexual sin. The, the shame causes you to be constantly thinking of ways out of your situation or something. I don't know exactly what the correlation is, and it's just a theory, but I think Jesus said this specifically here so that they couldn't compromise the message of Jesus. So that they had to know that this was from Jesus. See, a compromising church will weasel. They'll slip out of stuff. They'll slink and they'll slide. They'll they'll pray for healing and get a healing from God and then give credit to medicine. They'll (laughs) pray for rescue, get rescue from God, and then give credit to a friend or family member. They'll Pray for financial blessing, get it, and then give credit to their workplace. (laughs) They'll also get correction, get sat down, get rebuke, and then they'll excuse it away. They'll blame everybody else. They'll deflect. We do this sometimes when we think, if if it wasn't God, then I don't have to (laughs) change. I can keep going in my sin because... God didn't bail me out of that. My workplace did. God didn't bail me out. The medicine did. If, we're, if we truly acknowledge that God used the medicine to heal me, God used my workplace to rescue me, whatever it is, then we have to give credit to him. And we have to make our lives line up. We do this because we don't want to make changes. We're not ready to repent. We want to stay in our sin. We can't imagine life without it. And it's just easier to compromise. I can have a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of sin, right? For so long, sure, there will be a period of time where God allows it, sure. He's slow to get angry, but he does get angry. Jesus mentioning a specific detail here 
would have made it clear to this church that there was no getting out of this one. It wasn't made in error. It wasn't from John's pen. It was from the Holy Spirit. It wasn't for some other church somewhere else. It was for them and only them. Now, we still have it today, but remember, it's always important to remember what did what was Jesus saying to the people it was originally intended for. Then we can figure out what it means to us. There's no wiggling out of this one. It's for you and only you. You knew Antipas. You know I'm talking to you. Listen, Jesus sees everything. Jesus sees. He is aware of everyone who is faithful to him. And when we aren't, right? He knows you're here. This is what this means for us today. He knows you're here. He knows you're still here, even despite all the challenges. And he says, good job. I'm glad. But he also knows you're still hiding something. And there are times when he says it's time to come clean. It's time to get right. Don't go any further until you make this right. He sees the details and he gives us his full attention. I think this is why we see Jesus look into people's eyes in the Gospels. The the four writers of the Gospels specifically mention Jesus looking into their eyes. He looks at people. He gives them his full attention. He is fully present. He wants them to know that he sees them, not just physically, but he sees their soul, their intentions, their desires, who they are deep down. We are exposed before Jesus. To some, that's terrifying, and it's why your inner world is something you should be working on far more than the outer world. Teens in particular, if you're still in the room, listen. Because I see the world is begging for you to see people who spend far more time on their outer self than their inner self. They want you to believe that is beauty. The fake hair, fake nails, fake cheekbones, fake (laughs) eyelashes, fake everything. That's beauty and anything less is not. I'm not saying any of those things are inherently evil. They're not. But when you pour way more money and time and resources into them than what's going on inside, there's a problem. You're in danger. We're in trouble when that's the case. God looks past all that. He examines the heart. He truly sees past all the outer stuff and looks at you. Even the little things you think no one notices, he does. Revelation 20 also tells us that we'll stand before him someday in judgment. What will he see then? So this commendation comes with a detail, something not just anyone would know or acknowledge, but Jesus does. After the commendation comes the correction. So he says there are some things that I need to address. Good job. You you stayed loyal. You stayed faithful. Even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was killed. Good job. However, I have a bone to pick. Revelation 2.14 says, but I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some people among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Now, false teaching was infiltrating into some people in this church, and it was destroying them from the inside. From the inside. So they weren't outright denying him, right? They weren't allowing the world to convince them it wasn't real or that Jesus didn't exist or deny him altogether. They weren't just allowing fear of the world to infiltrate. This is not that. They were just allowing selfishness to invade them personally. They were just adding things in to their faith in Jesus that they had to know wasn't right. They were allowing themselves to be deceived. You know, we have that power. We often blame the deceiver, but we allow it. Anyone know the story of Balaam from the Old Testament? It's in the book of Numbers. Remember remember the talking donkey story (laughs) from Sunday school? Right? Uh, Balaam was talked to by, I mean, it's a crazy, bonkers story. One of those just crazy Old Testament. But, but it's actually much more intricate than it even gets into in the book of Numbers. And we see Balaam mentioned a few times throughout Jewish hist- history. This would have meant something to the Jews. They would have been so indignant that Jesus brought this up, I think. Because Balaam was a for-hire prophet 
who used incantations and spells and sorcery to influence the gods for or against people. So he'd negotiate a price with someone to do favors for them and to call down curses or blessings on certain people. That was how he made his money. And so there, there were this group of people called the Moabites who were adversaries of Israel. And Moab's king was a man named Balak. Balak was scared of Israel. He had heard how God miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt, how he had moved their enemies out of the way in the past, and he knew he was next in line. And so he, he hired Balaam to curse Israel for him. But when he goes to curse Israel, and there's a series of events that happens, if you read through the story, it's crazy, but Balaam soon finds out that he had no power at all to command curses over God or God's people. When he went to speak, it was only blessing. Which, by the way, the lesson to take there is you better be careful when cursing God's people. <sighs> be careful when cursing his servants. Think twice. So even though Balaam wanted to, he wanted the money, right? He wanted that paycheck. He could not curse God's people. He could only bless them. And there's some back and forth that happens. I won't go through the whole thing because it's chapters and numbers, and the story doesn't even end there. kind of trickles throughout Scripture. But just because someone hears from God doesn't mean they're representing him well. You see this precedent throughout Scripture, too. Moses rep misrepresents the heart of the Father and is sat down, right? <laughs> and so just because someone hears from God doesn't mean they are representing him well. It's why we test the prophets. It's why we look out for false teachers. It's why we have to be on guard, spiritually speaking. Balaam was not a good guy, but he did hear from God. That will blow apart some of your theology. <laughs> the, there are all kinds of stories. I just heard another one this week about the strategies of Satan actually sending people in to attend churches and infiltrate them from from the inside. The people sent by Satanist groups to act like a regular churchgoer, even give big gifts and weasel their way in and then cause dissension, right? Cause you all to split apart. It, it's cr strategic and organized, the enemy. <coughs> so just because someone is in the church doesn't necessarily mean they speak for God. It's why we are on guard. It's why we use our discernment and it's why we ask the Holy Spirit. When in doubt, love but also look at the fruit. Love, but also the Bible says judge them by their fruit. We often, I think it's one of the strategies of Satan actually to like, you're not allowed to judge. No, no, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says judge by their fruit. So <laughs> I'm going to love wholeheartedly, but also it doesn't mean I have to trust wholeheartedly. Judge them by their fruit. Anyway, getting off there. What happens in the end of this Balaam story is that he can't directly curse God's people, so he gives a recommendation to the king. And he said, you can't curse them, but you can corrupt them. You're not allowed to touch God's people, but you can cause them to corrupt themselves. You can tempt them into bringing a curse upon themselves. Put a stumbling block in front of them. And it turns out it's not even that hard. It was through their stomachs and their private parts that he tripped them up. It was not even that hard. And we can entice them to eat food offered to idols and we can entice them to fall for Moabite women. You see it happen in the very next chapter in the book of Numbers. It's exactly what happened. Balaam encouraged adulterous women to seduce the Israelite men. They committed fornication and other sexual sins. Some of them married the women even, causing them to take on their religion and offer sacrifices to false gods and idols. Evil infiltrated Israel, and it wasn't even that hard. And they did it to themselves. <laughs> they weren't able to be cursed. They brought a curse upon themselves. They were corruptible. As long as they were obedient to God, they were untouchable. But they were easily swayed and therefore easily destroyed. If you're only obedient to God when there are no other good options, are you obedient to God? There's this Jordan Peterson quote I heard lately where he says, A harmless man is not a good man. Have you heard this? 
a, a good man is a very, very dangerous man who has that under voluntary control. I did that just, I kept thinking about that this week because it's like, if obedience is your only option, are you obedient? What are you when there are other options? <laughs> I think this is actually the whole point to life. I think the whole point to God allowing sin in the world right now is we are learning obedience through the things we're suffering, like Jesus. We're learning obedience through the things that we're suffering, not the things we're enjoying, not the things that bring us joy. It's the things we're suffering we're learning obedience from. <laughs> Nobody ever said Revelation was unicorns and rainbows, guys. <sighs> So in Revelation, when Jesus says there are some who espouse the doctrine and teaching of Balaam, he's saying that corruption and deception has gotten into the church of Pergamum, and it was on purpose. It was by design. He wouldn't have called on the name of Balaam if it weren't. Someone was purposefully leading them astray. This wasn't a drift or a forgetfulness like the first church. It was deception, and it was corruption. The word says, you shall have no other gods before me. It's real clear. You shall have no other gods before me. But these guys, they corrupted the holy institution of marriage and the system God set up to correct it. Sacrifices. And all that idol worship and sexual indulgence caused their relationship with God to be compromised and contaminated. The same thing was happened that that was happening to Israel. The same thing Jesus was saying was happening to this church at Pergamum. The same with the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. He mentions them here. We don't know a ton about these guys. I wish we did. But I did find the word Nicolaitan is derived from two words, which means to conquer the laity. Laity meaning like non-pastors, the general church. Sin was infecting and corrupting the church. Listen, we need to flee from all forms of sexual immorality and indulgence. Sex is sacred between a husband and a wife, and all other sexual activity is detrimental. Detrimental to ourselves, to our relationships, especially that of our spouse, but it's detrimental even to our relationship with God. It destroys us from the inside out. Hebrews 13 says, give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Ephesians 5, 3 says, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes, these are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. Marriage is to be held in high honor. Our culture has zero honor anymore when it comes to sex. There's no honor there. It's seen as commonplace. It's every day. It's just a physical thing. No big deal, right? As Christians, we ought to have high standards for what we allow ourselves to do and to see and to take in. The world does not make this easy. <laughs> The world says, indulge yourselves. Listen to every sexual whim and desire because that is your true self. It's not what God says. We should be doing everything to keep sexually pure. In fact, any sexual activity that does not involve your spouse is wrong. That's biblical. Though God's not trying to keep you from having fun <laughs> or living your purest self or whatever, God is actually trying to keep you from hurt and pain and from destroying yourself from the inside out. God's not sex negative, whatever the world terms are. He's very pro-sex. He created it. But he knows it's best when it's within the loving, safe relationship of a married couple. Outside of that, it's an empty substitute. It's a counterfeit. It's a knockoff for real intimacy. Once you look for satisfaction somewhere else and go down that road, it slowly erodes and eats away at your soul. The marriage relationship mirrors the relationship of Jesus and his people. You shall have no other gods before me. Our union with Christ is exclusive, and that's a picture of our union with our spouse. Exclusive. In Pergamum, sexual 
purity was considered strange. They actually viewed sex as a way to please me. It serves me. Does that sound familiar? Today, most people believe that the primary purpose of sex is for individual fulfillment and pleasure. That's why people's identity gets all wrapped up in it. And their own preferences and desires. I identify as this and that and fill in the blank. We're making up new ones all the time. We're so rebellious. I can't even conceive of the fact that God, the creator of the universe, may know a little bit more about us and how we work. Right? He, he created us. He's got the manual. He knows more about what I need than I do. And you think when you're doing it and the world wants to convince you it's no big deal. Who am I hurting? It's just a little fun, unwinding, letting loose. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. Your soul. It goes deeper than the physical. You may not see it at the time, but it goes down to your very core and your identity. The way that you look at yourself changes, and the way that you look at yourself determines the way that you look at God. And so it will begin to erode your relationship with him, too. You won't be able to hear from him anymore. You won't be able to offer pure sacrifices to him anymore. It's why these, things, these two things went hand in hand. That's why worship doesn't feel like it used to. It's, you know, worship is a sacrifice of praise, right? But you can't offer pure sacrifices when you're engaging in sexual immorality. It's why fasting might not work as well as you want it to. These things were connected in Israel and Balaam's day. They were connected in the church of Pergamum, and they're connected today in our souls too. When you allow yourself to be corrupted sexually, you're allowing your relationship with God to be corrupted too. The sin of Pergamum was that they not only tolerated sinful behavior, but they allowed Balaam into the church. Someone was pushing this agenda purposefully for Jesus to use this concept. Because Jesus loved them, because Jesus loved them and wanted what was best for them, he's sending this stern warning. He sent a picture of himself with a sword. He sent an inability to weasel out of this, and then he sends some counsel. So what's the fix for this? What could possibly get us out of this? Revelation 2.16, he says, repent of your sin, and I will come, or, sorry, repent of your sin, or, this is an ultimatum situation. He's serious. Repent, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Notice he said he would war against them. It wasn't the pastor or the leaders of the church that were sexually immoral, although they may have been allowing it, right? But it it was the people of the church that were enabling this by participating in it. He's not calling out the Balaam from church. He's calling out the people participating in it. It was only their repentance that would stop Jesus from coming with a sword. Jesus said it was time to repent or else he himself was going to deal with them. He's basically saying, you take care of it within yourself or I will. Take care of the sin before sin takes care of you. Notice that it also says suddenly. I will come to you suddenly. I have seen time and again so many people have their entire lives ruined, ruined by sexual sin. It's one of those things that takes a little at first, just a little, here and there. It slowly reels you in over time until it blows up your life from the ground up. And it always happens suddenly. But we think it does. Hits us over the head. It robes us in little by little. We excuse a little more and a little more what used to get us that high. It doesn't anymore. And so we need a little more and a little more. And suddenly it's found out and it blows up your life. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It starts with a little bit of compromise. That's why this is the compromising church. A little here and a little there, but so much better to have a little bit of self-discipline on the front end than a lot of pain on the back end. Be proactive rather than reactive. Jesus is calling them to repentance before he's coming with discipline. And when it comes to sexual sin, by the way, There are doors that you open here that you can't shut. 
not spiritually speaking. We can repent. We can be restored with God. Not saying you can't repent, but not all relationships can be restored because it takes two to do that. And the other person may or may not forgive you, and that's free will. The other person may have to deal with the repercussions of your actions for the rest of their lives, as in the case of abuse or rape or adultery or things of that nature. So (laughs) there are doors you open you cannot always shut. Jesus is saying, repent now before it gets to that point. It's better to do the right thing the first time. You might think you can hide your sin forever because you've done it successfully so far. But let me just warn you, just as Jesus was warning the church in this letter, there will come a time when your dysfunction will outpace your function. I'm just going to let that one sink in a second. There will come a reckoning. God doesn't allow evil to persist forever. He will expose secrets. I actually believe this will probably happen faster in a Christian household. Because now that you've heard the word, it may happen soon. God is saying, turn around while there is still time. Jesus gives opportunity to repent. And it's out of love that he does that. It may not feel like grace today, but it's overwhelming grace to be given the opportunity to stop destruction before it happens. There is still time to repent and to turn back, to have restoration with God. Until your dying day, there is still time for that. And repentance and forgiveness actually do a ton toward restoration with people too. But you got to mean it and you have to be all in. (laughs) No turning back. Jesus is calling this church to repentance, but he also has some good news to those who choose purity, innocence again. You know you can return to innocence. The Bible talks about innocence not as something that is broken and lost forever, but something you can return to. You can return, repent and return to innocence. So I know this has been a tough message. Again, Revelation was never, has never been accused of being light and fluffy. But there is hope here too. Right? Here comes the hopeful part. Revelation 2.17 says, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. Meaning, I will feed you. You don't need that secondhand idol worship food. I will give you manna from heaven. <laughs> and I will give to each one a white stone. And on that stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. He's addressing identity here, too. It's so amazingly deep here. God, please help me (laughs) communicate all of this. Jesus promises a twofold reward here. Number one, manna and a white stone. It's this kind of revelation language that just drives me crazy sometimes, but it can be explained. First, manna. Manna is a picture of spiritual nourishment. The church has been eating food that was sacrificed to idols, metaphorically. It's been, I mean, they were doing it physically, but also metaphorically. It's been eating leftovers, expired, gross food, spiritually speaking. When you're in sin like that, everything you try to take in spiritually has a funk to it. Because it, it's down to your very identity. It's why we hand out the 40 IMs at the serve desk. Right? Because it, it, we have to change the way that we look at ourselves to truly understand who God is. He wants to do that from the inside out. <coughs> but when we're in that spot where, where, where we're eating things spiritually that have a funk to it, it's so hard to get back to God because it's all perverted and gross now. Sacrifices aren't pure anymore. <coughs> Serving isn't pure anymore. It's feeding us and our identity, not not our spiritual walk with Jesus. And there's a difference. But Jesus has more than that for his people. That's what he's saying. He wants them to be spiritually nourished from his very hand of provision. In Exodus, the Israelites were on their journey from Egypt toward the promised land. And God supernaturally provided manna from heaven to his children. It would just appear out of nowhere every single morning except one. And on the sixth morning, it would appear double. I mean, miraculous 
It sounds magical when you think of it. I mean, just supernatural, perfect provision from heaven. And it was a sweet bread. You know, I have been making bread for about six or seven months now. It's good. But it's not easy, especially sourdough. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and I don't have to grind my own flour or <laughs> make my own oil or but right? If I had God-made bread just appear out of the sky in my yard every day, oh, oh, you can bet I'd be all about it. But it's what God was <laughs> telling this church, I have for you. It's easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. My, my provision just appears for you. All you have to do is take it. Open your Bible and read it. Life-giving word straight from the Holy Spirit, tailored to you, even though it was written thousands of years ago. It's magical and, and supernatural and amazing when you think about it like that. God has that for you. In the New Testament, Jesus calls himself the bread of life best nourishment of all. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, who wants to nourish and enrich and provide for us all that we need. All that we need. Can you believe today that Jesus can and wants to provide all that you need? All your needs he can provide for and he can be the nourishment, the fulfillment that you've been searching for. The deep down acceptance and love that you've been yearning for. He wants that for you. But true submission says, if he's not providing it, I must not need it. If he's not providing it, I must not need it. We, in our rebellion, think God's not providing it, so I better take it. Jesus says he has all that we need. If I trust him, then I need to self-discipline and make my actions line up with those words because he has everything I need. He has manna, spiritual nourishment for anyone who has ears to hear in this situation. But the second thing that he promises is a white stone with the new name on it. I love this one. There are so many layers to this one. I just kept, as I was researching, I kept finding new ones. Because, first of all, we should be looking to him for a new name, a new identity, a new, we are a new creation in Christ. We should be looking to him for all of it, our sexuality, our wants and desires, everything that we need are within him, not our every whim and emotion. I didn't say everything we want, everything we need are within him. But the stone meaning here is so cool, too. Allow me to end with this today. Back then, certain stones carried certain meanings, and there were several things Jesus may have meant here, and they are all deliciously interesting and have major implications as to what Jesus may have meant here with a white stone. First of all, a white rock was used in the court system as a vote of not guilty. A person was given a white stone as proof or evidence of an acquittal. There's no evidence against you. Not guilty, okay? Number two, another meaning of a white stone could have been that in this culture, when a slave was granted freedom, they would receive a white stone as evidence of emancipation and freedom. It's not even it. (laughs) If you're stuck in sexual sin, emancipation and freedom, the thing that you want more than anything in the world, and I mean stuck, like you've let it get to the addiction level. Jesus wants to give you a white stone of freedom, emancipation. He wants to declare you not guilty and emancipated from that thing. Third, a white stone was also given to a soldier who has come back from a victorious battle. As God's soldiers, we are victorious. We've been given the verdict not guilty. We've been set free from slavery to sin, and we are victorious warriors in his name, but there's even one more. A white stone would often be used as an invitation to a banquet. (laughs) I'm not joking. It's crazy. A special feast and written on the stone would have been your name. So if we can 
be faithful. If we can turn to him in repentance, it's not even like God only wipes away the sin. He gives you a new name, a new identity, an invitation to be with him forever. He makes you victorious here and now. I mean, the implications of that. I have goosebumps. <laughs> if we can be faithful, we'll be chosen and invited to a banquet, the greatest banquet in the world, the marriage supper of the Lamb. A personal invitation with our new name on it, and we'll be called not guilty, free, chosen, included, and victorious. God is so good. All we have to do is call on the name of Jesus. Repent and be saved. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. We have been given a new name, a personal invitation with an all-access pass to heaven and everything that God has in store for his conquering church. We become the conquering church, not the compromising church, with repentance, turning to Jesus. That's all it takes. If we can reject Balaam, if we're loyal and faithful to him, he has declared us worthy of eternal life. How good is that? <laughs> like, I know these are tough words. This series is not warm and fuzzy. They're tough, but this one in particular, if you have been stuck in any kind of sexual sin or you are compromising in any way, taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that, adding it in, Right? We're, we're idol worshiping here and there while also trying to worship Jesus. It doesn't work. Jesus is calling us to repentance today. If you have been stuck in any of that, you know the shame and the pain that it can cause. You know this is a tough word. But the quicker you can come to terms with it, the quicker you can confess it and leave it behind, the better. Use today as an opportunity. Can we do that together today? Father, after hearing a word like this, there's nothing to do but to turn to you. Help us not stay stuck. Stuck in our sin and shame, these cycles of abuse that we put ourselves through. Jesus, use today as a, an opportunity to give each and every person in here struggling that white stone of freedom. Emancipate us from sin and shame. Give us a new name, a new identity. Make us new creatures in Christ. Truly transform us from the inside out. Holy Spirit, speak to hearts and minds today. If you need to surrender your life to Jesus, with heads bowed and eyes still closed, I want to give you that opportunity. Every single one of us have sinned. Romans 3 says, for all have sinned, right? We all fall short, the standard of Jesus Christ. We all stand before the Lord guilty. Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life, meaning it's a gift. It's not earned. He gives it freely through Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, Father, I know they're guilty, but I will pay the price. I will pay the price for them. So we go from guilty to acquitted in Jesus' name. He covers it. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can read the Ten Commandments today and realize every single one of us has fallen short. God in his grace made a way for us to be saved. All it takes today is to believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. And you will be saved. So today I just want to lead us through what we call the sinner's prayer. Around here we call it, I'm in. I'm into following Jesus. I'm into the forgiveness that he provides. I'm in. 
And all you have to do is pray, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on that cross 2,000 years ago and you rose again for me, for my salvation. Please forgive me for my sin. Come into my heart. Give me a new start. In Jesus' name, amen. That's really as easy as it is. So today, I'd just like to give you that opportunity. Sometimes it takes a, a hand raise, a response, right? The Bible says we confess with our mouth. So it takes a response toward Jesus. So with heads bowed and eyes still closed, is there anyone today in this room that would like to say, I'm in? I want to pray that prayer today. First time or the first time in a long time. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up right where you are? I want to give my life to Jesus. Anybody else? Keep that hand raised for just a moment. The usher just has a, a card they're going to slip in your hand. Some more information on it. Anybody else? If you're watching online, you can text the number on the screen. I'd love to talk to you about this as well. You can also type I'm in in the comments. Okay. Praise Jesus. Secondly, I know we are living in today what seems like the seat of Satan. Sometimes it's all you can do to look around at the world and think he has deceived and corrupted so many, and it's even within me. Pergamum had it wrong. They tried to marry both Jesus and the world. They let the doctrine of Balaam seep into their church. We have to stop it. We have the opportunity to stop it today by pure, simple repentance. There's so much grace and mercy God has for you in repentance. 100% slate wiped clean with God. And you just say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to follow you. I want to do this your way. So what do you need to lay down at his feet today? That's what we're asking the Holy Spirit. What do you need to walk away from in order to follow Jesus wholeheartedly? Some of us today need to admit out loud to somebody what we've been a part of and choose to walk away. Now, I'm not saying you have to shout the most shameful moments of your life to everyone. In fact, please don't do that. But I'm saying you need to trust someone, tell someone. The prayer team is here at the end of service today and every week for just those reasons. People I trust to pray over you, to hear confessions, to join with you in a prayer of repentance, committing to God again. I don't trust just anyone up here for prayer. These are people that have prayed about this, taken it seriously, and only want the best for you. They're committed to this church and to you. So trust the process. Confess, get prayer, be free today. Aaron and I are always here for you too, of course. But just before we end with heads bowed and eyes still closed, I'd just like to say one more prayer over you today. And I'd like to know who I'm praying for. If you're saying, I repent, there is something going on in my life right now. I'm choosing to repent. Would you just raise your hand? Father, thank you for each and every person moving towards you today, making that tough choice of repentance. And God, I pray that you would just wash over them with your love forgive wholeheartedly and uproot that thing from the inside out, that they would not only change their behavior, but that you supernaturally would change their desires from the inside out, change their soul, heal us, God. You be our everything. We wouldn't go to all these other things for nourishment and fulfillment, but only you. Thank you, Jesus, for these letters to the church. Thank you for the, the blessing that we sang over ourselves today. And I just want to read it because it's also from number six. I want to read it over us, and I just want us to receive it today before we end. Would you just sort of put your arms out to receive this blessing from God? Because I know this word has been tough, but God wants to send you away with hope today, with blessing today. Amen? So may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. 
Father, we claim that blessing in this church today. In Jesus' name, we thank you for the gift of repentance for your gift of these letters to the churches that we can learn so much from for our church today. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you would take us from a compromising church to a conquering church. In Jesus' name, that we would be able to truly be that vibrant, passionate, selfless church you've called us to be and change this world with the message of the gospel. It's nothing less will do it. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.